firstly, I would like to thank the organizers. I was just thinking that, you know, uh, when we are going to organize uh, this uh, kind of uh, felicitation for uh, Professor Ramakrishnan, and, uh, you know, you showed the, showed the way, and I am sure that a couple of more are going to come up very soon. And so I thank the organizers for really firstly to organize uh, such a conference in the honor of, uh, you know, uh, Professor Ramki, as he popularly is known, and uh, for giving me a chance to really speak here. And I immediately grabbed it once I got the uh, uh, invitation. So let me tell a little bit about, uh, you know, Ramki, as, uh, you know, people are all serious mathematics is going on. So I am the first student of uh, Ramki. And, uh, uh, you know, it was almost, uh, if we are not too far as far as age is concerned. And uh, so it's like a friendly relationship that I had with Ramki. And I got all, uh, all I mean, I was privileged to have the only student. And in fact, uh, you know, all the time of Professor Ramakrishnan learned everything from him. And uh, he taught me even uh, how to write, uh, you know, how to take and how to write a paper. And, uh, you know, uh, I used to go back after discussion uh, we, we were staying together and he will cook and you know this famous uh, pongal and uh, dosa and uh, idli and really had a great time with Professor Ramakrishnan and uh, I'm sure that at this milestone of, uh, of his life he must be looking back and uh, you know proud uh, you should feel I mean I'm sure that you must be feeling proud looking at the students that you have uh, you know uh, students are all I can see all of them are here most of them and they are all placed in very good places. And the way you have uh, brought them up uh, academically, uh, you know, in every way. So that's real credit to uh, Ramki. And uh, he's so, so caring. That's, that's one part that I have learned, at least. I am sure all of his students have learned that part from him to take care of the students. He's uh, one person uh, to whom uh, anyone can go at HRI uh, over the years. And now I'm sure he has taken up a new responsibility. The place also will come up uh, similarly. So I chose this, uh, this topic uh, uh, to really symbolize in the sense that I'm the first student. And it's a joint work with the youngest student, uh, which uh, Ramki, who will be submitting thesis uh, very soon, Rishabh Agniyamuthi. In sense, some sense, it's a good symbol that the first one and I don't know the last one or not, but Ramki might take more students, but uh, you know, with Rishab. So uh, uh, yeah, I uh, really wish, uh, you know, pray my prayer, my uh, best wishes for Ramki to carry on like this for long, long uh, years to come. We have to contribute there. With these few words, let me uh, go ahead with uh, my presentation. Okay, thank you. So uh, the title is, uh, Quite all know it's a modular form conference in modular form, the strum bound for a square free coefficients of Hilbert modular form. So, as uh, you know, some introduction, then I'll talk about the main theorem, some tools, and some idea of the theorem, and then end with uh, some references. So, modular forms, that's nothing there to really introduce, but just to keep the notations going. K and N are positive integers, gamma naught N, all of us know. And uh, the definition of modular form, just to put it on the frame, uh, 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 all of us know, and uh, uh, it's a cusp form uh, if it vanishes at all the cusps. And in particular, we have this uh, nice Fourier expansion for these, uh, these objects. And these AFNs are uh, called the Fourier coefficient, and in particular, AFN will be the NS. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, uh, Rashi, recording is not on, I think. Uh, no, the media team is recording it. It's fine. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Sorry, it's sir. okay. Oh, no. it's, it's, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, AFN will be denoting the NS Fourier coefficient for uh, this form F. And we have MKN and SKN as usual. So a classical question uh, in this theory uh, uh, is uh, to determine a modular form. I'll more specifically will tell what you mean by determination of a modular form by a subset of all these Fourier coefficients. So in this direction, uh, the most talked about result is the so-called, that is the title, the Strom's uh, bound, uh, which states that, uh, that we, you have a positive constant uh, lambda such that you have to count only that many, uh, like lambda k is the weight, 
and n is of course wave fixed. So if AFN is zero for all these n's up to that lambda k n, then in fact the form is identically zero. Okay, so in other words, suppose you have two, you can transform or translate this question to this question that I have two forms given f and g, two cusp forms. And if we can compare the coefficients f n and j, and you see that they're equal up to this uh, bound lambda k n, then we conclude that the forms are identical. It's the same question. So there are many results, uh, you know, such a strong type of results, like one can talk about multiplicity one theorem, uh, which states that if two new forms have the same eigenvalues for almost all the, uh, you know, this uh, Hecke operators TPs, then they are, these forms are identical, almost all. And a stronger result we have, of, uh, which is of Dinaka Ramakrishnan, is that one has to check the primes, uh, only that set of primes, having the Dirichlet density more than seven over eight. So these are some results which are there. There are many more results. So just some of these results which are interesting in the literature. So a similar question one can ask that, you know, we are adding over all the Fourier coefficients and now you confine yourself to a square free Fourier coefficients. Okay, how, uh, can, uh, and a variant of this question will be how many square free Fourier coefficients are required to determine a modular form, determine in that sense. So for classical modular forms, the answer to this question was given by Anandi and uh, Somo. Uh, and uh, the first one, first one of their work, they used prime number theorem for uh, L function associated to these uh, primitive cast forms and obtained an upper bound, which was in fact uh, exponential, uh, the first result in nature. Later, they improved the, uh, the bound by using the rankin selberg l functions for primitive cross forms. And uh, their result is this. So, uh, chi is a Dirichlet character modulo n uh, with uh, conductor m chi, such that n over m chi is uh, square free. And uh, let f in sk n chi, certainly non zero we are taking and fix and epsilon bigger than zero, then there exists a square free integer n, square free, less less k to the power three plus epsilon n to the power seven over two plus epsilon. This is the bound they got from the exponential one from there to here, such that if uh, AFN is non-zero up to this, oh sorry, uh, AFN is non-zero, so that means the form is uh, uh, non-zero. You have to check only that much. If you find that your, you find one AFN which is non-zero, then the form is in fact non-zero. And this implied this constant here depends only on this epsilon that you have uh, chosen. Okay, so this is uh, the classical result for uh, by uh, Das and Anambi. So the purpose here uh, in this uh, talk is to consider the same question for Hilbert modeling forms, general Hilbert modeling form. So let us go into a little bit of this uh, Hilbert modular form and we'll be using this adelic setting. So just a little bit about that before we go into the theorem. So F is a totally real field. All the embeddings are real uh, and uh, degree is N, number field. And I'll be denoting by OF the ring of integers. And H by narrow class number of F. By narrow class number, I mean the order of the narrow class group. And the narrow class group is simply, you know, I, I F, take uh, all the fractional ideals and quotient it out with uh, principal fractional ideals generated by totally positive elements, generated by alpha. So that sigma of alpha is strictly bigger than zero. So they, uh, that's what is called narrow class number, uh, the order of this group, narrow class group. And uh, choose a complete set of representatives of this narrow class group. Let's call it Ti. And this collection I equal to one to H. H is the order of the narrow class group. Now corresponding to each integral ideal, uh, let's call it N, I mean that uh, Gothic N, and uh, uh, each representative for this Ti, what we have it here, for each of these representatives, 
there exists a congruent subgroup that's uh, of GL2F. Uh, let's call it gamma i n sub i. I will be uh, symbolizing that uh, representative, ith representative that we have chosen. So this is simply gamma i n is a d, where a and d will be coming from the ring of integers. And uh, t i is that uh, you know representative t i inverse b t i c. And uh, b is in the uh, inverse of the different ideal. You know, these are invariants associated with the field F. And C is n times that different idea belongs to that. Okay, and AD minus BC is a unit. So this is gamma IN. So each of these representatives, if I choose, I will have a congruent subgroup gamma IN of GL2F described by this. Now you have to fix some uh, multi-index notations because uh, we'll be in Hilbert modular form. So K for me is K1, K2, Kn, positive integers. And uh, not putting any condition, no parallel, nothing. So they could be all distinct. And uh, Z is Z1, Z2, Zn. And for any scalar A, uh, Zk will be this, this multi-index notation. Z to the power K, Zi to the power Kj k equals to 1 to n and uh, gamma k will be similarly and k naught for me will be the max of k1 k2 up to kn this will be fixed throughout and a to the power k is simply a to the power sigma j equals to 1 to n kg for this multi index notation for here we have to remember this k naught so here's the definition for the classical uh, hilbert modular form uh, uh, so it's a weight k uh, is a holomorphic function and copies of H to C, F of gamma Z. So we'll have all, uh, you know, multi-index notations here, determinant gamma to the power minus K over two, CZ to the power, CZ plus D to the power K F of Z for all gamma, the gamma I N. Remember, this is one for each representative T I. And I'll be calling uh, the space of such forms of weight K and level N that got in the ideal, integral ideal, mk gamma i n. And uh, if f is not equal to q, that is the degree extension strictly bigger than one, then holomorphicity is not required. Satisfies automatically. Okay, so such a form f i, I will be calling because of that i, that representative that we had of weight k has a Fourier expansion of this form. So if I z is a i shy, so this psi, this is running over all totally positive elements. So bigger than bigger than zero means it's totally positive elements and it's belonging to T i O f. Zero is also I have taken here for the constant term, an exponential of trace of psi z. That's the Fourier expansion form of the Fourier expansion for uh, the classical Hilbert modular form. And there's a work of Shimura, which associated uh, H tuple, so H remember the narrow class number of the uh, totally real field that we have started with, F1, F2, FH, the H tuple of classical Hilbert modular form. So I'll be denoted by, I'll be denoting this, class, uh, this selection uh, by FI, I equals to one to H of weight K on gamma I N to an idyllic, not going into this definition or uh, this not setting up the, stage for uh, adelic things. It's telling that uh, to an adelic uh, Hilbert class form F. And this will be that bold F or script F, whatever, and this will be little f. For me, this F1, F2s will be the classical ones. And this bold F will denote the adelic one, uh, Hilbert class form. So it's a fact that it, well, it's associated uh, with F, associated uh, with an uh, automorphic form on GL to AF, where AF is uh, the Adele ring of F. And I'll denote by SKN the space of Adele Hilbert cusp forms of weight K and with this level, which is an integral ideal. Okay, so now there is a relationship between uh, this CFM, the Fourier coefficients of this adelic, there should be a collection over this M, uh, curly bracket is missing here, of F and the Fourier coefficients AI shy of this uh, FI for each uh, FI here, each FI, and this is for uh, that uh, 
with respect to the tuple, uh, the H tuple F1, F2, FH, we have this F. So this is the relationship that we'll be writing by CFM. It's AI psi, psi to the power minus K naught by two, norm of this ideal K naught over K. So this is the relationship between this classical one uh, Fourier coefficients and that of the Adelic one. So this will be used. Okay, so let's look at the uh, main, uh, main result. So for each integral ideal, M, so M is of this form, psi, Ti inverse, Ti is one of these uh, representatives there uh, in the class of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, the, the narrow class group, OF for a unique I and for some totally positive, this is totally positive always for me, psi in F. So that was the relationship that I was talking for that, uh, you know, this M, CFM, CFM, AI psi. So this relationship holds for this uh, M where M is an integral ideal of this form for a unique I. So for this uh, representative is for everyone, there will be an M and for some totally positive element psi in F. So this is the relationship between the classical one, this side and the Adelic one, the other side, the Fourier coefficients. So now let's take the theorem. Uh, so F is a non-zero Adelic Hilbert cusp form of this weight and level is this N. And uh, this is the norm of uh, this integral ideal. K naught as already I have uh, denoted the max of K1, K2, Kn. So here is the result. So this is, uh, as I told you, is joint work with uh, uh, Rishab. And this has appeared in the Ramanujan journal. So Fb, as we have defined, CFM, again, uh, this bracket should come with M, denote its Fourier coefficients. So then there exists a square free ideal, integral ideal M square free with norm of that square free integral ideal less, less K naught, three N plus epsilon, norm of that N, six N square plus one over two plus epsilon, such that CFM is non-zero. Here, the implied constant depends on epsilon and on the field F that we have started with. Now, this theorem, as I stated before, the result of uh, uh, Anambi and uh, Das. So this is a generalization of theorem one, because if we put uh, N equals to one, you can see that it will come out to be the result. So when the degree of extension when F is equal to Q, uh, this will imply their result. So in that sense, also this is a generalization of their result. Okay, so this is the, uh, the theorem that I'll give you an uh, out, outline of this, the proof of this result. So we'll talk about some Dirichlet series that will be used here. So let us choose two uh, primitive cusp forms of adelic uh, primitive cusp forms, F and G. They're normalized with Fourier coefficient CFM, let's call it, and CJM respectively. CG, F and G will be corresponding. Now alpha one P and alpha two P, so we know the roots of this quadratic polynomial, CFPX, Psi P, Psi P is either one or zero. Similarly for G, beta one, so I'll be calling alpha one and alpha two, beta alpha one P, alpha two P, and beta one P, beta two P for uh, G. Okay, corresponding to F and for G. And now we can define this uh, ranking silver convolution of F and G that I'll be denoting by LSF cross G. And uh, this is the definition, the zeta Fn, I'll just tell what is zeta Fn 2S. And this is CFM, CGM by norm M to the power S. M is in OF, an integral ideal, M is not zero. 
So this is same as zeta fn to s r s f cross g. I'll just give you. So this is that zeta f to s with one factor missing, the dedicated zeta function. So zeta f zeta f n to s is simply the dedicated zeta function, the standard dedicated zeta function zeta f to s times this factor was missing here. And R S F uh, cross G is simply this product. It's just a short form that we're writing it. C F M C G N by N M to the power S. Okay, so we started with two uh, two uh, primitive cusp forms, but uh, yet, uh, and then we have did, written down those uh, that ranking silver convolution of F and G. So we can, uh, so let's first look at this uh, Dirichlet series LN SF cross G. LN, N is that, uh, you know, the level that we have started with. So this is equal to all those, this, this product will run over all the primes, which does not divide uh, that ideal N. So one minus N of P to the power minus two S. And then you uh, take that one minus alpha I P, remember alpha, beta, those, uh, roots of that quadratic polynomial that we had associated with f and g alpha i p beta j p bar n p to the power minus s minus one so this is for me ln the first Dirichlet series that i was talking about that we'll be interested in and the second one is lb s f cross g so again uh, for p does not divide uh, that uh, starting ideal integral ideal eta one plus cfp cgp and p to the power minus s. Okay, so uh, here this can be this can be so the, here the square square free thing is uh, uh, going to come for us. Uh, so uh, so here we have uh, here the sum this uh, this uh, hash sign indicates that the sum is over all square free integral ideals m. If you just write it uh, in a, a series form, then it is. Uh, CFM CGM by NM to the power S, but this sum is over this hash should come over here, and that indicates the sum is over this square free integral ideas M. That is of our interest. And uh, M and N are co prime. So this is the, uh, these are the two uh, Dirichlet series that will be of our interest. Now, there's this relation hold between these series. Firstly, uh, ln s f cross g is simply l s f cross g f s. I'll just write down. This is a, a convergent Dirichlet series. No harm. Uh, it's a, you know first thing. And l b s f cross g. Now this ln s f cross g it can be written in this form. Ln little work is there. That is, uh, if one is interested, can look at the paper. Ln s f cross g h s, where f s and h s are Dirichlet series which are absolutely convergent. Uh, on that half plane, so they are nice. Okay, so this is the uh, we we introduce two new Dirichlet series in terms of this ranking server convolution, and then uh, wrote down the relationship that they satisfy between themselves. So now we'll be using a result of Shimura with the uh, analytic continuation of that uh, ranking server convolution. So for that we introduce this L infinity, the product of these gamma factors. So I'm fudging up here, j equals to one to n, and then uh, we can define this lambda as f tensor g is this uh, L infinity, and then L s f plus g times uh, this norm of this uh, different square ideal times n to the power s. So this is lambda s f cross g. Now this is a result of uh, Shimura, which tells you that uh, the function this lambda admits an analytic continuation to we'll C as an entire function if f not equals to g. If f not equals to g, it's just entire. Otherwise, uh, it has a meromorphic continuation to the whole plane with possible simple poles at one and at zero. And the residue at one is given by this. If f is uh, not equals to uh, uh, f is equal to g, then you have this uh, Mm, residue at s equals to one. So it, it, it involves the regulator here and you have this dedicated zeta function, the special value at two. And then uh, this is uh, the totally positive one inside the square of the units. And this is the Peterson inner product, what we have for uh, this uh, 
uh, corresponds there. This is a group of units. Okay, so this is a result of Shimura, which tells you, and it gives you the residuals at one. That it is uh, nice, mostly. So this is a fundamental result to prove what, uh, prove the theorem that I was stating. Uh, the time is just uh, flying. So uh, 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 f and g are primitive, and then for any c between half and one, for every epsilon bigger than zero, the following holds. As you understand, we want to uh, show that uh, you know the uh, square free. Uh, how many such coefficients you have to check the square free so that uh, the form is non-zero. So if f equals to z, then uh, the CFM that has is again the same thing that you know square free uh, ideals is running over, and CFM square this f is a smooth uh, 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 cutoff functions which usually you use it n m over x. This constant comes out here, and then a f f x plus we go of this uh, error term is there. And if this is f f equals to g, and if f is not equals to g. Then we have uh, C F M C G M because F is not equal to Z, and F of N M over X is bounded by this. And here, uh, uh, this A F F the constant comes up here when F is equal to G is uh, can be estimated and it is uh, bigger than bigger than uh, this uh, uh, K naught N N to the power minus epsilon. K naught is the max. Okay, so this is the main uh, result. So the idea behind the proof, uh, this is the main result, is uh, the Mellin inversion formula, which will be kind of relating uh, this uh, uh, Dirichlet series and the question that uh, we are interested in. Let's consider this integral i, which is uh, over this one to two. I'll be taking it as a vertical line real s equals to two, and I take l b that particular uh, l function that I had introduced x to the power s. This is the uh, you know Mellin uh, transform of f s d s. And now once we sub the value of uh, LB SF cross G and use some more this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, absolute convergence of certain infinite series, we can easily write down one way. So we want to calculate this integral in two ways. One is just directly subbing in the value of LB SF cross G and uh, using MF. And then we can get this uh, thing CFM, CGM, FNM over X very easily. Okay, so this is this is what we are interested in. This you see, uh, the sum is over all the square free things. And the other way, what we will be using uh, the relationship between LBS and LNS and LS across G. And then we'll equate that one, and that will give us the result. So uh, the, it can be related, uh, which is uh, uh, for that we have to choose the contour uh, uh, around two properly, so that uh, you know we have these horizontal integrals, we have the vertical integrals. We have to calculate this integral by subbing in the relationship that we had, and then uh, one can show that the horizontal integrals vanish, and then uh, by using Cauchy's uh, integral formula and this Rankine-Selberg result that uh, Shimura I had shown, one can calculate the integral, then equate with this one that will give the result. That's the idea. So this is the contour that we choose uh, around two, and uh, uh, the line segments are this. And then uh, we have to, once we sub in the, the relationship, as I told you, from LB to LN, and LN has direct relationship with this LSF cross G, that uh, rankin selber convolution, put these values here. And uh, then using Cauchy's integral formula and uh, that similar result that I was quoting, one can calculate this integral. The horizontal uh, integrals, there will be uh, three things that you have to calculate. So the, the horizontal integrals, that's a little bit of work is there to show that uh, that vanish. And then the other, yet you can use Cauchy's integral formula and calculate uh, this integral. And then, uh, so this is either one or zero, depending on whether f is equal to g or f not equals to z, because there's a pole or not no pole. And uh, uh, this can be, this residue can be calculated by using, as I told you, that uh, the, uh, the ranking silver thing. And there is this result of Hofstein and Lockhart, which helps you to calculate this residue we, at s equals to one. And that turns out to be that a f f will come out with k naught n n to the power minus epsilon. And then once you put this uh, estimate that it is delta f g times this residue, put it plus this g s, which is uh, this of this order, then you have uh, the result of that uh, lemma, that uh, fundamental result that I was talking about, where f equals to g and f not equals to g. 
right? So it's just calculating this into because one is directly subbing in the values and then uh, use the relationship between these L functions and then calculate explicitly the integral. Equate them, that will give you the result. Now the proof of the theorem. Uh, uh, so we appeal to the new form theory of Hilbert modular forms. That is that uh, you have uh, the Hilbert cusp forms. There will be these old forms coming from the lower levels and then uh, I mean the uh, orthogonal set will be this uh, new forms. So it tells you that if, uh, suppose this is a basis, let F1, F2, Fm, be basis for the space of new forms of which k level dividing n for sk n. So this is the idyllic uh, forms. And let's take f. So this is the basis. And let uh, f is uh, in sk n, then by new form theory, what is that? So each f, so this f, so we can relate it to this fi's. This is a slash operator. I, I'm sure it's a modular form conference. All of you are aware of that one. So a i q f i slashed with b q. And here, what happens? It's with a i q. These a i q's is zero if f i is not a new form of level n over q. So otherwise, it will be zero. Okay, so let Q naught dividing n is an ideal with uh, the property that norm of Q naught is less than or equal to norm of Q prime for some other uh, ideal Q prime, which is not equal to Q naught dividing the level. And AI Q naught is non zero for some i. So I want to simplify this one. Now, on comparing the Fourier coefficients indexed by Q naught m in uh, Q naught m in this, this four here, left, uh, you know, I'll be comparing. Where m is a square free integral ideal co prime to the level. Then one can write the CF Q naught m by this AIQ CFI. So F and here each FI in terms of the FIs. So you can further simplify that one, noting that uh, if NQ is less than N of Q naught, then this is zero. And also if Q naught equals to Q naught, then CFI M Q naught over Q is zero. So if you note this one, then for some r less than or equal to m, this will become cf q naught m is actually i equals to one to r a i q naught c f i m. This is the most cleaned up version that we have it from the new form theory from the basis for each of them, uh, for each of the and arbitrary as form you take it. Now this is we set s is again that same notation hash. So CF Q naught M absolute, we take the absolute square. F is that cutoff function that we have started with. We'll fix it later, NM over X. Now split it in the sense that you write AI Q naught C uh, FIM and the bar of that one. And then separate it out by making uh, uh, is, is diagonal and a non-diagonal. And here in each case, now you can use, this is uh, when F is not equal to G and this is when F is equal to G, you can use the fundamental result to estimate this uh, two terms. That was the main result that I had shown. You put the values there. I mean, the estimation that you have it. So S uh, becomes this, is a FIF. So it is just uh, putting the estimate here. And uh, we can use Cauchy Schwarz inequality. And there's a bound, we use the bound on the space of SK n over Q naught. Use these two things. And finally, we can show that S is bigger than bigger than this AI Q naught square. And then this, this term comes here. Now you have to choose your, now one can check that uh, in the right hand side. Uh, so, so this equation is independent. This equation is independent of the choice of F. So we'll choose F in such a way so that This uh, CF Q naught M square is bigger than bigger than that. Uh, you know this this term it will become uh, this right hand side of the above. This inequality will be always positive. So it is always uh, 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 non-zero that we will get it. CF M Q naught square absolute value square. Okay. So this is this is the standard technique that we usually adopt to show that you know the first non-zero. Uh, uh, um, coefficient, what is the uh, uh, end where this uh, first non-zero coefficient will uh, 
Milakar. Okay, so uh, so one has to note that the right hand side is a square here, and we can check that this is always the quantity is positive. Whenever we could, we choose our x bigger than or equal to this particular, you know, remember the theorem that we were stating, k naught n into three minus two epsilon for plus four epsilon n n over q naught, and this is the exponent that was coming up, with c equals to half plus uh, epsilon. So whenever we choose our x bigger than or equal to this, the right hand side will be always positive. So this completes the proof of uh, the main result that uh, we had. Of course, I mean, some work is there in between which I have uh, uh, you know, suppressed. And, uh, but if one is interested, one can have a look at uh, the paper which is there uh, in uh, already published. And let me give you the, some of the uh, references that I had used. That was the paper of Das and Anambi. There's two papers that I was uh, looking at it. There's some other work I did long back with uh, Petri Yanis and uh, Srinath Baba when I was a postdoc there. This was uh, uh, for Ziegel modular form, it's already known this result. And for Hilbert modular forms, one can look at uh, this. This was the Nakara Ramakrishnan's result. That was Hofstein Lockhart result that we were uh, talking about. There's some relationship with the L functions that we were talking about when it was by Harkos. And of course, we have this uh, standard text. That was Shimura's result. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for this nice talk. So now we are open to questions or comments. Can I ask a question, Kalyan? Sure, Dependra. Uh, if I can answer, yes. No, no. You see, uh, I always like to think in terms of elementary things. How does uh, this uh, relate to one variable proofs which are available? So uh, I do not know what are the various proofs available in one variable. I mean, one variable means this uh, this uh, this same square free thing was Das and uh, uh, Das and Anambi's proof that you were talking oh, about. Oh, so they they did it for uh, one classical one, modular form, yes. Classical modular forms, yes. And uh, what would you say is uh, the uh, crux of uh, their proof? Yeah, and their proof also. Their the, the 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 first one they did not use this ranking cell work. And uh, I think they got a bound which was not very good. It's of exponential type, so that uh, not much of uh, use. But uh, in the second proof, they used this rankin server convolution, rankin server L function theory, rankin server theory, and they improved. So more or less, we had a similar. We, we have we used similar technique, but in the uh, uh, in the more variable case. So you would say rankin server convolution is one of the main inputs. One of the main input, and uh, you know the relationship between those. Yeah, so uh, that result of Shimura, that you know this calculation of the residue at s equals to one, yes. and uh, uh, some relationship between some uh, variant of this ranking cellberg L function that has been used. Because somehow you have to bring in this square free part. It's but basically, it is ranking cellberg uh, uh, convolution that uh, uh, which is the main tool here. I mean, the point would be that if uh, many Fourier coefficients are zero for F, then for the Rankine convolution also, um, many of them will become zero. And you can then estimate it, which will go against the estimate on Rankine convolution. Yeah, it seems like that's the main, uh, main idea behind it. Okay, okay, good, good. Are there any more questions? Okay, looks like no more questions. So let us thank the speaker.